Natasha, um, I'm going to I'm going to be talking about some James Webb, um, how 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 James Webb communicates with its ground stations here on Earth. Um, I just generally chose this topic because I thought that it's quite a many there. There's a lot of um, media hype on the James Webb in the like. There's a lot of media hype in general about the James Webb, and yet nobody ever seems to cover uh, about uh, um, how how data actually gets from those as they call it miraculous instruments down to the earth. So this is what I, I decided to talk about just to spread some awareness about this. So. All right, here we go. So before we start, I just uh, wanted to quickly uh, talk, maybe, or just quickly mention for two seconds something about me. So I'm a big fan of XKCD. I, uh, yes, I'm sure we all like XKCD here. Um, I uh, receive weather satellite images um, from my ground station at, uh, at my house. I do uh, dabble in a bit of astrophotography and uh, yeah, so. I uh, enjoy board games, card games, exploding kittens, that that sort of stuff. All right, so um, all right, so I think it's fit. I think we can start. Okay, there. So I'm I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, some James Webb specifications, uh, pictures, data. Then we're gonna do like a quick crash course in satellite communications. Um, um, some satellite, how to track the satellites, how GSN knows how to track the satellites, so, um, uh, how they track them. Um, yeah, and then we're going to tie it all together. I'm going to explain um, stuff about James Webb. Okay, so first of all, I think it's fit to start with uh, James Webb itself. <laughs> Most people say it's the world's best space telescope. I like Hubble. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, it has a great resolution, the infrared range. Uh, it can hunt for planetary spectra. It's a Person, I well, it's important to me, and I think to all of us as astrobiologists, because well, uh, it can hunt for um, the rise, the composition of the atmosphere. Hence, um, we'll be able to figure out whether it's a planet where life could arise on, or whether it's, um, uh, or whether maybe life is already on the planet. So uh, we'll always we'll be able to figure that out using uh, because the James uh, Webb Space Telescope can actually hunt for planetary spectra. Um, they have improved detectors for um, uh, for better sensitivity, better than Hubble and uh, new instruments, and of course, lots of gold of steel. I mean, uh, look at this giant gold coated mirrors. Anyways, so so James Webb Space Telescope instruments, uh, near infrared camera. Uh, this take pic uh, this takes pictures in near infrared. Uh, again, mid infrared camera, uh, same 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 idea except it's in mid infrared. Um, near spec, there's the, um, it's a near infrared spectrograph, uh, so it can uh, split things into component frequencies. Then there's the near infrared slit spectrograph, which can um, sort of um, uh, look at a tiny source of light. There's also the fine guidance sensor and uh, various other instruments that are on board. But I, I was more interested in these imaging instruments, since these are the instruments that provide the most data flow out of James Webb. And I'll be focusing mostly on these. All right, so I think also it's fit to look at a uh, little bit of James Webb data. Uh, here I can gaze at this all day. Uh, Stefan's Quintet, right? Um, rise, and it's important to note here that I shall, uh, as I shall mention later in the presentation, these aren't actually true color views. So this isn't what you'll actually see when you're looking with your eyes at the um, presentation. And this is the um, um, uh, at the stars, and this is some planetary spectra. Um, again, when I started making this presentation, this was um, this was from the first data release. So, okay, so uh, again, this is a large chunk of the presentation. How is this done? Um, I mean, we have these we have these pictures stored on board the um, uh, many people. I, I I remember there was a huge explosion of stories one day about the uh, 68 gigabyte hard drive on James Webb. Um, there was a massive explosion of uh, oh, okay, never mind. Um, so there's some, someone banging on the door. Never mind. So um, there was a there's a lot of media hype on um, this 68 gigabyte hard drive. Uh, but how do we get? Okay, so we have the hard drive in there. Uh, how do we get it back to Earth? I mean, the James Webb Space Telescope is still up there in space, I mean, as far as we know. Uh, and um, and it's um, and somehow we need to get the data down. So 
um, I think here it's bit, uh, we're going to do a um, crash course in satellite communications. Here we go. So um, I think it's uh, easier to imagine a satellite orbiting Earth instead of uh, a satellite with a, a satellite orbiting a point which is a solution to the three body system, but never mind a uh, three body problem. So I think instead we can. Uh, it's easier to just talk about in general satellite orbiting Earth. All right. So uh, we have a satellite. It orbits Earth. Um, this one specifically in this uh, in this picture, it's geosynchronous, which means that it's quite literally in the same spot in our sky. So as you can see, it's period. So the amount of time it takes to make one revolution around the Earth is exactly equal to um, the Earth's spin rate. So as yeah, uh, so we have a satellite up there. How do we communicate with it? Well, I mean. Up until recently, and still, um, most, most, um, uh, nearly every single satellite communicates using radio. So, um, in order to communicate with radio, we need various antennas. Um, these all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, however, um, they, they, they can all be used for satellite communications, but again, um, depending on the satellite you're trying to receive, and, um, uh, and uh, depending on the signal characteristic you're, you want to use a one. Now the WIP monopole antenna. This one's quite simple. Um, it's used. It's used in car radios, nice and um, nice and easy using car radios. Um, Yagi antennas. These are used for television. Um, these can also be used as um, uh, these can also be used as satellite communication antennas, most definitely, because uh, these are um, they have a high gain. I shall explain what that is later. Bowtie antennas, they're not really commonly used as satellite antennas, but sometimes they are. Dipole antennas, these are used as something called feeds for dish antennas, which I shall also explain later. Uh, and the dish antenna, now this is most commonly associated with satellite communications. I mean, when you think of a satellite, you think of a dish antenna on there. So, or a parabolic antenna or whatever you want to call it, same, same thing. So uh, how this works is that the metal, uh, like, the other. So the metal is shaped, excuse my crude drawing here, but the metal is shaped in a parabola, and I know that's not a parabola, but whatever, uh, pretend it is. It's shaped in a parabola, and each parabola has this wonderful property called the focal point. And this is where all the waves, all the waves of the radio signal, they arrive in phase. So they all sort of add up together, of course, to a stronger signal. So that's, um, yeah. So over here, we can put our feeds. So these are feeds. Um, uh, again, depending on um, various satellites you want to, there's preferences for each for each satellite usually, uh, various feeds for each satellite. Um, I like using dipole feeds because they are relatively they're 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 nice and compact, especially at high frequencies. Uh, some people prefer to use helical feeds, as seen over here. Um, yeah. So again, this is again a matter of personal preference. Um, so the again the um, parabolic antenna is uh, very important to satellite communications because it can actually oh and also there's um, if you haven't installed a television antenna um, you have one of these at the end this is also theoretically a wave uh, a waveguide anyways so why can't we use this as one of our satellite communication antennas um, first of all this can work this can work. But this, um, this it can receive over the entire sky. So what this means is that um, we can only receive very strong transmitters because in radio there's a trade-off. Either you can, um, you can, you can either receive a stronger signal, uh, or uh, you can receive a less stronger signal and um, get coverage all over the sky and not have to move the antenna. Or you can receive a stronger signal and actually have to move the antenna in order to keep it trained onto the satellite. Um, this is actually used for simple uh, weather satellites that broadcast in the 137 megahertz range. Um, yeah, th this is uh, again for most satellites. This is not the case. This is a, this is only like literally used for three satellites, maybe four. All right. So instead, instead we use these large antennas. And unfortunately, I do not have one of these in my backyard. I have a slightly smaller version, uh, maybe um, on a ratio, though, I don't know, 100 to 1. Anyway, so mine is about one meter. My internet parabolic antenna is around one meter. Um, I can show pictures of it later if needed. 
uh, th this is uh, this is a parabolic antenna, and in this case, it's trained onto some satellite, and it's sort of like narrowing out the signal. It's narrowing out the signal from all the other sky of background noise. This is how a parabolic antenna works. It's sort of, um, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's used for, on the other hand, if, the, if it's, uh, on the other hand, if the satellite is moving through the sky, you do have to move the antenna uh, with a great precision too, actually. Anyway, so we use these in satellite communications because they're very handy for communicating with ha satellites that are uh, even lower orbit. Like I use these all the time. I mean, not this one specifically, but like one, uh, one, one meter antenna. Anyway, so uh, let's just quickly. Um, so once we have our, uh, I'm going to quickly talk about bandwidth uh, constraints, and, um, and then we can go on. So uh, we have a ground station and a satellite. Uh, want to communicate with the satellite so we have a um, we have dish antenna on the satellite dish antenna on the uh ground station over there somewhere yeah somewhere very close to uh, or something um and essentially uh, the ground station sends a signal up to the satellite asking well uh, whatever whatever satellite is it can be a communication satellite it can be uh i don't know uh, it can be an imagery satellite whatever so the satellite sends stuff down sends stuff back down um and then uh, like what's the difference? The only difference here is that um, what the difference than a ra regular radio station? The difference here is that it's over what thirty six thousand kilometers away. So we need to use high gain antennas. Now bandwidth constraints. We have to be very careful about what we send, and we have to compress a lot of it, just because. Um, so for example, there's a nice hump over here, another hump over here. This is called a Fourier transform. So essentially, how this works is you see amplitude on you see amplitude on the y scale and uh, frequency on the x scale, and this can uh, this can help us to see in the it's called a frequency domain, whereas the time domain is amplitude over um, time. So, anyways, so here on the leftmost, this is this is a telemetry. So you can quite literally see on the Fourier transform bandwidth. So you can see that the smaller hump has a much smaller bandwidth than the larger hump. Now this is telemetry on the left and imager on the right. Now uh, notice how it's it seems slightly weaker, the imagery than the telemetry. Um, again, this satellite has adjusted for this, but when you transmit it, you with a wide bandwidth, you sort of spread out your transmitter power over the entire bandwidth, which results altogether in a lower signal to noise ratio. Uh, so I uh, think uh, on, uh, where the telemetry, right? So the imagery has a much higher bandwidth, whereas the telemetry, they, like there's no need to send it so fast. I think it's a good idea. It's well illustrated here. This is again one of my screenshots from one the uh, from a satellite signal that I received a while back. Uh, telemetry is on the uh, right, uh, sort of in the center-ish over here, is the um, global area coverage, and at the left is local area coverage. So local area coverage, uh, here you transmit like literally what the satellite sees. Global area coverage, you have to transmit what the satellite saw over its entire orbit. So obviously the uh, the global area coverage has a much wider bandwidth. And even though the transmitter power is completely the same, you can see that the global area coverage has a very, very, um, has a very, uh, the SNR signal to noise ratio is much lower than in the um, signal with the um, local area coverage. Oh, there, and I have some fancy arrows. All right, so now that we finished that, I wanted to quickly talk about, um, no, not quickly, actually, this is gonna be the rest of the presentation, um, <laughs> about the James Webb. All right, so first of all, we're much farther away than simply in lower orbit or even geosynchronous. We're actually orbiting around a point called Lagrange point two. This is, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's essentially, there's a three body problem. This is essentially where all the, uh, this is essentially where the gravity balances out and you can just orbit it. Anyways, a lot of complicated physics in here, uh, but I won't talk about this. Okay, so how do we track where it is? To track a telescope, we need uh, ephemeris. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. That's my way of pronouncing it. I think I am. Um, so ephemeris elements, these are, these are used to track uh, spacecraft that are outside of our, outside of our um, Earth. Uh, uh, not Earth-bound spacecraft, uh, interplanetary. This is used in order to. This is used in order to um, 
uh, these essentially are just giant lists of everything you need to know to track, uh, to, to, um, to move an antenna towards a satellite. Earthbound spacecraft are tracked by uh, two line elements, TLEs. Um, so fMRs can be computed uh, by various programs. You can use XFM, um, uh, JPL Horizons, etc. So various programs. TLEs, um, just a quick example here. At the time when I did this presentation, that, this was the most recent two line element for NOAA 19. Now you plug this into a program like this. Give me a second. There, you pro plug this into a program like this, and um, you can see everything. Every you can, as we know the two line elements for all these satellites. We know, for example, when the satellite is going to pass over. Please cooperate. Thank you. I don't know. Let me show my entire screen. I don't know if you can see that. So upcoming passes for my top C. So Verizon, you can compute quite literally where everything is. Um, so that's the way we track satellites, uh, earthbound. Um, Satellites. All right, they're back to Falcon Center. Okay, so uh, antenna moving. Unless you have one of these in your backyard, I certainly don't. You can um, uh, usually amateurs enjoy uh, uh, having an antenna rotor in order to move antennas. I still prefer hand tracking. It's just uh, uh, easier than to set up all the software required. Anyway, so um, these are essentially mini versions of these, except. Um, in the DSN, they obviously have a slightly larger budget than, I don't know, $500. And hence, they can afford slightly better motors uh, than amateurs can. So uh, these probably, these easily can move two tons of an antenna. Anyways, all right, so let's quickly, okay, so let's, while we're here, actually, let's talk about the DSN. Um, it was originally built for the Apollo missions. Uh, they have many antennas to receive Verizon spacecraft. And they receive interplanetary spacecraft and some Earth observing spacecraft. Sorry for the typo. Essentially, they have uh, essentially they they are the people who receive the data from James Webb. Um, it transmits so now to James Webb actually. It transmits S band telemetry at 2.235 gigahertz, so 2,235 megahertz. Um, it uses compression on instruments. Remember, we talked about the bandwidth and why it matters. Uh, it transmits imagery data uh, to cab band. I shall explain what that is in a second. And it uses um, something called data framing, which is essentially stuffing all the data into various small chunks of it called packets, which you then send over an unreliable link called radio, and uh, you reconstruct the file at the end. All right, so this is a 2013 paper that summarized the Gene Webb Space Telescope data transmission. Uh, again, there's not a lot of documentation on this, surprisingly, but I was so surprised to find this image, I can quickly explain it. So, the telescope, OTE, then it goes to region 1, where um, some data processing happens. Um, it's then sent into a custom format, NASA's custom format called SpaceWire, nice and fun. SpaceWire science data packets. These are packets are essentially, again, uh, um, tiny chunks of the file, um, which are then transmit over an unreliable medium, such as radio, and you can sort of reconstruct the file back again. Um, this is, so region two is where packet uh, processing happens. Uh, in region three, so ISM, C, and D, H, I don't know who came up with the, uh, who came up with the letters here, but uh, whatever. Um, so this happens, there is a reordering, averaging, and compression. So you can press the packets, um, you can average the data itself that's inside the packet. So um, what this means is like um, you can have if you have multiple images, you can average them into one big image. Anyways, um, you can uh, it, you reorder the packet. Sometimes there are some advantages in transmitting a file backwards instead of uh, from beginning to end, from end to beginning. Um, then you go into something called uh, PDUs and CCSDS CADUs. <laughs> again, weird namings here, but um, these are essentially, again, packets. Uh, then I go to the DSN station. Uh, they do a little bit of tiny bit of file processing. Um, then they send it over to their uh, other station, which uh, finishes up the data processing. Then they send it to the Science and Operations Center. 
um, at NASA, which then extracts the image data. So they send only the packets. They don't even get to look at the image data or whatever. All the decoding is actually done in the Science and Operations Center. Um, this is where image data happens. You can extract the image data, decompression, calibration, yeah. Uh, and then it's actually sent to the proposer, which is actually what this is, is actually um, you can request time on James Webb Space Telescope, actually, in order to, you can request time in order to look at specific objects. Anyways, all right. So there's also IEEE. They did a small article on this. Um, they talked to Sasha. Yeah, we we kind of need to wrap up soon. Just yes, so yes, yes. I have I have a few more slides. Uh -huh. So uh, again, same stuff. Uh, 2.9 gigahertz science link. This is the higher the frequency, the higher the data rate. Uh, James Webb downlinks about 59 gigabytes a day, and there is something called beam width, which is the range in which you can transmit at. And this is this is used as oh, where is it? Oh, okay, never mind. Sorry. Uh, this is used as this is sometimes we need to repoint James Webb's antenna in order to point at Earth. If it so, this cannot happen while James Webb is doing an observation because otherwise this will ruin everything because I have to steer the entire telescope away from the object. So this is definitely not going to work. So first, James Webb does an observation, sorts it on the hard drive. Then every day for uh, every day during four hour sessions, it just downlinks all the data to Verizon ground stations. All right, and now finally, quickly, once we get the once we get the data, um, how are we how are we processing it into um, images? So, first of all, all of James Webb Space Telescope sample and actually black and white. This is essentially they and every single uh, every single every single um, uh, instrument sample samples in black and white. What this means is it's just quite literally um, uh, how how bright the electromagnetic spectrum is in that little chunk of the electron. How bright the signal is in that tiny bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's what the black and white images represent. Um, so when you, so yeah, tiny, tiny, tiny chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when you, this is, for example, one uh, channel. This is one channel from actually a Hubble Space Telescope image. Uh, it was just easier to get Hubble Space Telescope data. So I decided to go with that. Um, when you uh, add all the three channels together, you get a nice and um, fun, we colorful image. Now, how this works is again, there are three component colors, red, green, and blue. Um, you, you just assign the brightnesses. You just assign the brightnesses from each little chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum to each of the red, green, and blue uh, bands of the picture. This, oh, this, famous, this famous photograph also has uh, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen in the, um, in the stuff. So, okay, so when, we, so when we take data from James Webb, we actually have to um, combine it, all the black and white channel images, um, into one final picture. Uh, this is again an example from uh, one of my satellite images. Uh, for example, this is uh, visible near infrared, close to uh, close to UV, and then when you combine them, you get a color image, just like that. All right. And just like that, with James Webb, you're able to process the process various uh, channels and completely shove them into one full colorful image. Um, and there again, there's a lot more going on under the hood than what I could fit into a 20 minute presentation. But uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So every time you look at a space image, I think it's a, a picture of space. I think it's a good idea to just think about what it took to make this image possible. How much work people put in who made this possible. Uh, if, you're, if you enjoy this, you can go to DSN to work for this. And that you can do this too using some amateur uh, equipment that's available freely. And uh, again, remember, so space is for everyone, no matter the nationality, race, etc. Humanity must step forward to explore space together and not as separate countries. Again, we're in this together. Okay, thank you. That's the end of what I did. Thank you. This was absolutely amazing. Sasha, that was so Thank cool. You. So, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone. Could we raise our hands, Julia, to ask questions? How do you want to do the questions? Sure, sure. Well, just go ahead. All right, I'll ask a question real quick. Sasha, you have so much knowledge. That was really cool. 
um, I learned a bunch about the, the the processing system for getting JWST data back down to us. I, I hadn't seen that graphic before, including all of those those crazy acronyms. Yeah. I wonder if if you've heard of the famous story of the Parks Observatory in Australia and how they almost didn't have the Apollo landing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was definitely yeah, that was definitely very fun. Uh, do you want to yeah. mention it or? Uh, so, uh, so I mean, if you, actually, if you, if you want to explain to everyone what happened, I, I just I, I think it'd be great to have you in that kind of control room in that kind of event because it sounds like you could fix the problem. Um, uh, why don't you tell I us? Don't what, 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 I don't know. I usually panic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all panic too. Anyway, so yeah, for those who don't know the story, anyway, so it was um when the moon landing was happening, um there so essentially there are two DSN stations and Parks Radio Station was one of them. They were receiving the signal from the moon, and essentially they were just going out of range of Long Round Station. They're about to be transferred back to Parks Radio Telescope to Parks Radio Telescope, and there was some sort of error in the whatever whatever they couldn't receive the signal. And it was really worrying. And two minutes before they landed on the moon, they just got a lock, and it was uh, nice and uh, fun. Yeah, for those who don't know the story. Yeah, we, we we very nearly didn't didn't have the Apollo landing. <laughs> we, we very nearly didn't have a chance to collect those data and would have to watch it later and, and the world wouldn't have seen it in live time. Um, and you did a great job explaining it. And like I said, I, I think having someone like you in the in the room would be great. I also I also loved your final message that space is for everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, what, what, what do you think your future holds in the next decades of your life? Um, do you plan on becoming an engineer or being involved in space operations or, or is this just going to be a hobby as you pursue other other interests i have absolutely no idea <laughs> <laughs> no maybe 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 something maybe something maybe something with uh, something with dsn or something maybe again I, I am always going to pursue this as a hobby no matter what there are some people at dsn who pursue this as a hobby with uh, p there are pictures of um them with um uh, there, are, there are small antennas tracking the exact same spacecraft as the big antenna in the background is. So it's, um, it's nice. It's, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So I'm probably going to go something for about DSN, and uh, or at least NASA or maybe SpaceX, something along the lines of that. I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. That's what I'm going to tell you. That's great. No, <laughs> I'm thinking about. I have it. Idea. I, I'm, I'm almost 40 years old, and I still have no idea what I want to be when I grow up. Ah, yes. Mike sounds the same, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, <clears throat> I'm almost twice Graham's age and uh, I keep reinventing myself. So I think the fact that you haven't picked something, I see that as a good thing. And uh, so if I can comment here, um, it was really good presentation from the standpoint of telling a story. You had a beginning, you had a point to it, a middle, and the end, you wrapped it up well. And everything is storytelling. It's true. <clears throat> Julie and Graham know this, even in scientific papers where you have to follow a certain uh, exact format. It's really about telling the story at public speaking. Of course, that's the way you get people's attention. So it was, it was really good. My, my background, well, I have a few different backgrounds uh, actually, but the one that is relevant here is in astronomy and particularly public outreach and education. I do a lot of speaking and <clears throat> writing and you summed up my life in your last slide there, which is, uh, you know, what I started under Blue Marble uh, Space Institute of Science. Oh, yes, yes is my latest uh, organization, which is called Astronomy for Equity. And the whole thing is that the stars are for everybody and doing astronomy for the blind uh, in uh, developing countries, all kinds of things like that. And so, uh, yes, yes. yeah, so, <clears throat> and I, I can tell you that astronomy uh, uses it to interest people in um, as students and show them they can do science or any STEM fields and people don't necessarily go into astronomy. You may not go into uh, radio communications with uh, faraway objects, but it kind of doesn't matter because everything you do is going to is going to help you in whatever you do. Yeah. So uh, that was really superbly done. Thank you. Uh, and communications, uh, human communications, <laughs> it may be harder that you, you know more about how, how James Webb is, it, you know, gets its data down to yes. Earth than I do. 
And so I learned from this and uh, that was cool. But uh, human communications is harder and uh, there, there aren't any books you can read about how to do it. So that was really well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was also wondering if later on somebody wants to take Sasha as an intern for any programs, you know, keep him in mind, especially you're dealing with radio astronomy or uh, some Thank projects you. like that. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, well, while I was researching for this, by the way, this, this site was very useful. It's quite literally a documentation of James Webb. Um, you can, if anybody wants to take a look, it's very cool. Anyways, they have a, they have a, they have an entire, um, no, a bunch of, a bunch of the, this is one of the only sites with like a detailed, uh, at least description of at least something about the radio communication system. <coughs> so if no, you want to take a look, definitely. Yeah. Another point is knowing your audience too. And it was clear that you, you narrowed in on the audience we have here, which is highly educated to some extent it can understand these things you know talking to the public we have to wave our hands even more and say well then some magic happens and uh, yes, uh yes. but you you know here everybody could understand most of what's going on and sometimes you just have to say well this is what it's called and this is kind of how it works and that's the best you can do so you know you filled in uh for me the gaps where my knowledge was uh lacking pretty well too Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.